my experience with Cap, talking to him, licking him, like first thing I asked his ass when he came in, and he got pissed at me, and I don't blame him. But I'm like, yo, do you still want to play? Like everybody, I hear all these other people saying that you don't want to play. This motherfucker just looked at me like, bro, don't ever ask me no stupid shit like that again. Like, like, and, but I was like, look, dog, I'm wasn't trying oh, to be I'm rude. I had to know. Because everybody else is telling me, you don't want to do this, that, whatever. I got you, I got the source. Like, oh, they're saying this, that. It's like, motherfucker, I'm working out six days a week, putting my heart to this shit. And we've seen now with even the videos that have popped up, the workout videos and shit, he still got it. Welcome to Iman Amongst Men. I'm Iman Shumper here with my big brother Ari. Ari, say what's up to the people one time. What's up, people? Uh, I'm Ari. Today people. we got king of uh, NBA Twitter, NBA <laughs> GIFs. Where's he at? Huh. Oh, he's right here. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm about to say right that. here. The man, Josiah Johnson. What's going on, bro? What's up, yeah. fellas? I appreciate y'all having me on this joint. <laughs> no way, yeah. See how this goes. Right here. But They're people say right that. Out. I don't I just don't like, I'm sure y'all know I don't believe like the hype or any of yeah. this work, man. Like I don't care about titles or none of that shit. I think people forget, like, when we talk kings, there was never <laughs> one king. Yeah. For you know sure. what I'm saying? There's a king of all kings, but there's always one king that could whoop every all the other kings, but that don't make other Kings not exist. For sure. So I don't know where I'm at on that king. Yeah, we don't know where you at on that. I'm trying to get to that level. The the Nagus Nagas, the King of Kings. (laughs) Everybody got their own kingdom, though. That's what's crazy. Like, and his kingdom is. It's the following. Yeah, it's the following that you have and how persistent they are, how engaged they are. So I think that's what make it more king. If a king raises his hand and say, We all walking this way, we kind of rolling. If you say that was a dirty foul, and everybody on Twitter the next day saying that shit was dirty. I know that you were real king in this shit. You know what but, I'm saying? But the thing is, if like, if whether I people that, like it or not, Stephen A. Smith a king. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. He'll say somebody dumb, and then everybody on the street will be like, yeah, they're dumb. What? <laughs> but yeah, I'll never say some shit's a dirty foul. I'll ask you, like, yo, is that dirty? Like, that's the that's the thing. Like, I think but a you lot hoop. Of, I feel like you get an opinion on it. Yeah, but not at the, again, like I tell Gil, I do the show with Gil, I tell Gil this shit all the time. He's like, man, jump in the convo. It's like, nigga, I did not play in the league. Why? Got what me. the fuck can I say to y'all about playing in the league? And that's the shit I, I, I problem I find with a lot of people in this game now is they'll get asked a question about some shit like that and yeah. they don't answer it. Like, if you right. ask me that shit and be like, I don't know, dog. I didn't, I didn't play. Like, what the fuck I'm going to tell y'all? No, that's about? real. Yeah, that's real. be real. on ESPN like, oh, He'd tell me what's going way. through with like LeBron's mm-hmm. mindset right now. Like, nigga, are you LeBron? Like, <laughs> right. I don't, I don't play in the NBA. I literally, I'm wearing a suit right now in a studio. Like, I don't know what the fuck y'all talking about. But yeah, it's all good. Uh, it's, it's cool. Right. Shit. No lies told. Yeah, you still, like a, you, still a, you still a king out here on Twitter, <laughs> though. I don't know. Appreciate you know it. I'll take it. If you can't guard LeBron, it's cool. But <laughs> on Twitter, though, you got a crown. Uh, We're going to dive into the idea of the grind today. Uh, We're going to focus on the grind. Uh, some it's very familiar space for you. Yep. Um, I want to start with how do you define the grind? What is that to you? I mean, grind, honestly, just work. Uh, you know, I think a lot of times, especially kind of this younger generation, people, they want to reach that mountaintop, but they don't want to put the work in. And that the grind is the stuff you don't see, the hours you put in the gym. A lot of people, you know, you show up for the games and that's all great, but it's the practice, being consistent, doing the work all the time, dealing with the highs and the lows, the bullshit, the positive stuff. Like just here, y'all introduced me as the king of NBA Twitter. <laughs> like people call me that shit, and it's just like I don't, you know, like you know, I, I don't let that stuff fade because you start believing that hype, start drinking that Kool Aid, and then you start slacking. Like, yeah. like kind of league, you get, you know, some dudes get that big contract, and it's like, well, damn, I don't even need to go to the gym anymore. Then others, like, I don't give a fuck how much money you give me. This is my love. This is my passion. Yeah, so for me, that's what the grind is for the stuff that I do. Like it's funny, man. I be getting like bags and shit now to do shit on Twitter. It's like I would do that shit anyway. Like I was watching this game anyway. It was gonna tweet and comment yeah. and do stuff on it. And now it's like, oh, this brand or that brand or this brand will pay you to do that shit. Awesome. And it's like, yeah, sometimes you gotta water it down a little bit for the bag and that's fine. But ultimately for me, the grind is just all the stuff that people don't see. And it's funny, once you reach that, that, that height and then you start getting some love and some acclaim and shit, then you start getting the haters and the negativity too that come out the woodwork. But they don't appreciate all the shit that you did to get to where you are. What's up? So, yeah, so I stay grinding. That's my thing. Like, anybody can talk to me like, "What you doing?" Man? I'm just grinding always. Yeah. I'll like work, put it in, go get it. You know what's crazy about the grind for me? When I think of grinding, I you remember the Tony Hawk game we had? We had Tony Hawk Pro Skater wow. around this time. Like this is grinding, grinding. You know when I yeah, Cliffs brought that out. So it was like I associated grinding with like, of course, your work ethic. Yeah. 
but we literally was trying to learn how to grind on rails. At what point did you realize you had something special with your Twitter account though? So this is the thing, man. So I was doing a, uh, a show for Comedy Central called Legends of Chamberlain Heights. And before that point, I didn't really give a fuck about social media, man. And I, I just didn't, I didn't use it. I thought it was a waste of time. Like, you know, I don't, I don't want to get sucked in where I was just using the shit all the time and there was no value. Right. But then we got the show and I started to look around. I'm like, well, shit, like, you know, everybody puts ad money up for this, that, whatever. But for me, social media, Twitter, IG, all those spots, it's, it's no, no better place that you can add, advertise and promote yourself. So I was looking at shows like Insecure with Issa and what they were able to do is building a community around the show. So their show would air on Sundays, but everybody would be talking about it all throughout the week. Be taking clips and memes and videos and all types of shit and applying it to other stuff going on in the world. So I was like, damn, I want to do the same thing with Legend of Chamberlain Heights. Didn't really know how to do it at that point, but just dove into shit. So I was, I was looking at South Park. I was looking at Game of Thrones. I was looking at Insecure. And just the way those shows had built like just a family around it. People that would really ride and die for that show. Like, so I started doing the same shit with Legend of Chamberlain Heights on uh, that account and uh, didn't really do a lot of shit on my personal at that point. But the whole time I was doing it, my wife was in my ear like, yo, you're doing all this shit for them. You know, you're making them all this money because I wasn't getting paid shit to do it. That's the thing I don't think people realize. <laughs> I was running, I was like, oh, I got a show on TV. I'm, I'm gonna get all this bread and shit. It wasn't really like that. And a lot of people will tell you when you get to Hollywood and you get that first deal, they fuck you on your first deal. Like, yeah. and people hear that and you don't, you know, cause you're like, oh, these niggas gonna be mean in the meetings and they're, no, nah, they're smiling. Oh, we love you, oh, but here's the deal. like and you're gonna take it or leave it. And it's like, all right, so you take it. So I started looking at social, and I'm like, all right, let me do that shit. I convinced him to let me run the account. And then it started hitting him, man. You talk about grinding. I was going, I was literally the star of the show, a writer, producer, creator, working like 12, 14 hour days on that shit, then doing like another six, seven on social. So anybody who saw me, I'd be in meetings, laptop out, and I'd be doing this shit, just trying to build followers, trying to put stuff out there, trying to put as much content out there. But after that shit got canceled, I kind of, my wife was right. I was left, you know, left in the lurch. Like, you know, I couldn't tweet from the account really anymore because the show was done. So I started running my own shit. So this is around like 2019, uh, Antonio Brown, obviously always in the news, making, making, making waves. Wow. But <laughs> I don't see loop his way into this. We'll get back to him later. We'll, we'll be back soon. <laughs> Antonio Brown, uh, I think he was on the Raiders at that point, got released, ended up going to the Patriots. So Josh Gordon, who I'm a big fan of, you know, one of my favorite football players, he was already on the Patriots. But the Patriots are known for doing things, you know, the Patriot way. Bill Belichick, he don't really fuck around, right? He don't play that shit. Like, mm -hmm. you come here, you gotta be a certain way. So I used a, a clip from Get Out, just the scene, uh, when they're, uh, when Lakeith's uh, character's in the sunken place, and uh, Daniel Kalua <laughs> kind of rolls up on him, he tries to shake, and he, you know, he gives him the janky, at he him. gives him the janky look, and I'm basically like, oh, that was Josh Gordon already there, greeting Antonio Brown in the Patriots facility. <laughs> so I run that meme, and that shit just goes crazy, man. Everybody's hitting it. Everybody's retweeting it. I'm literally, I was working at this company, Attention, over here in Hollywood, and uh, I, I would make the videos on my laptop, like kind of discreetly, because niggas would be all over my shoulders and shit. Then I'd post them on Twitter, and I would literally go sit in the bathroom, because that was like the only place where I could be alone. So I'd go sit yeah. deep stall in the bathroom. I know niggas thought my, I had bowel issues or whatever, because right. they would always see my feet in the <laughs> stall, but I would just be in there looking, refreshing the page, watching the numbers go up. So the next thing I know, Jordan Peele sees it. Jordan Peele quote tweets it. He says, you win, Josiah. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh shit, like, damn, Jordan Peele just saw this shit. And for people who know me, I, I know I do a ton of stuff in the writing side and all that other stuff in addition to social. And I always joke, like, if I go to my agent, my manager, like, yo, give me a meeting with Jordan Peele. They'll be like, okay. And then just, you know, give me all the lies that they give you in Hollywood. Oh, we're efforting, uh, we couldn't touch base, whatever, whatever. But literally, I made Jordan Peele come to me. Like, Jordan Peele quote tweeted it, followed me. I had a show on Comedy Central, he had a show on Comedy Central, so I DM'd him and just told him I appreciate you, bro, for laying this foundation to let somebody like myself be able to follow in your footsteps and be able to do the things you're doing. We kind of communicate in discourse, but that kind of just set it off. And from that point, I just started trying to put out as much content as possible, react to whatever was going on. Obviously, NBA, NFL, but pop culture is crazy. Like, I got my biggest kind of following boost during the 2020 election because I was just putting out shit just to clown both sides or whatever, whatever was going on in the world. But after that point, and then brands start rolling in, opportunities start rolling in, I start to get to do hosting shit, get to start fucking with Gil, you know what I'm saying, doing a no chill pot. And it's, it's funny, man, I did a, um, like a, a broadcaster boot camp for the NFL a few weeks ago, had a bunch of dudes in there, like Richard Sherman, Gerald McCoy, Kyle Van Noy, right. all types of, you know, mm -hmm. big name dudes and also dudes who maybe, you know, aren't his big name, but just told them like, look, man, at the end of the day, if y'all wanna really succeed in, in your, your career after football, you gotta build your shit up. Cause that's all they really care about, brands, 
networks, whoever, like if you come in with a solid following, which is sad, but nowadays, you know, if it's between the more talented person who's got a less social following and the less talented person who got, you know, millions of followers, they're gonna always rock with that person because they feel like that's gonna bring the eyeballs in to see the stuff. So I just kind of realized early on, like, all right, this is the way to go. And for me, like working in Hollywood, doing all that type of shit, you always got 100 people who are gonna give you opinions. You got execs who you gotta listen to. You got people that might tell you to do some shit. Like we're working on Legends, and this is a show about, you know, a basketball team in the hood and hood culture and shit. You got people who've never been to the hood trying to tell you, oh, we don't, this doesn't make sense to us, and this doesn't make sense. And it's like, okay, well, like it's gonna make sense to the people that I'm making it for. Not for you. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But when I get to the Twitter, it's like, that, that shit don't matter. I can put up whatever I right. want. And now those same people are like, oh man, we want some of that shit. You know what I mean? So being able to leverage and use social to my advantage to carve out a career. And now it, what's wild is like when I started making TV bags, like anybody who's worked in TV, like those, those bags are phenomenal, right? Like you get paid a shitload of money. It's awesome. But I started making more money doing the social shit. So now it's like, well, fuck. Like I can, I can spend my time writing scripts and begging people to give me a chance or I could throw a couple of tweets up. Like, I mean, <laughs> shit. Tweet right. away. Right. Tweet away. Right. Bam. Yeah. Real Brother. talk. Let me get a nice couch. Yeah. You and that's, that's what these tweets represent now. Like, oh, I need some, some work done at the house. Like, all right, this will cover the painting. All right, right. this will cover the new cabinets. Right. This will this tweet will get, a, like, you know, some gas in the tank or whatever. But that's a great part about social, too. You could be anywhere. Like, everybody looks at me like, oh, you got a team and this and that. Like, no, nigga, I'm at the crib. Feet Is on, it a finesse to get us to stay home? Yeah. Especially yeah. during the pandemic. During I the pandemic. I just feel like everything is a finesse to, like, stay all ass at home and stay on these social media platforms. I really feel like everything always. That's what he just said. The more eyeballs on it and the more you don't. But they're pointing know. everything to this. They're like, how about y'all just never come outside? No <laughs> yeah. And y'all yeah. just be on social. Y'all could FaceTime. Y'all could. We had Zoom. We had Zoom. We had all this shit just pop up. Man. And that shit, we, we were doing. So I was I was working on the Colin in black and white. We were in a writer's room for that joint when, when the pandy started. And for like artistic things like writers' rooms and show, you need to be like you need to be able to talk to people because some of the best ideas will happen during lunch or when you're just fucking around. You start talking some shit and it's like, oh damn, that would be great to put that in the joint. We go to Zoom, that shit was fucking terrible. Let's talk about your pops a little bit, man. Okay. Fatherhood, because he's a father, I'm a father, you're a father. You already know. And this for this show is for fathers, but your pops, man, Marcus Johnson, NBA legend, had his uh, jersey retired in Milwaukee. Um, played for the what the Bucks, the Warriors, and the Clippers. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, how was it growing up in that environment? You know, like growing up in pro basketball, being as young as you were, and like seeing your father as good as he is, seeing him like basically progress from. Well, you know, he I'm basically on, asking you, was this? Did you feel like you had pressure on you? Yeah, like, there you yeah, go. Like, sure. yeah. Did you feel like I got to be able to hoop because dude could hoop? Yeah, right. I mean, I think look. You, we always joke, if you if you grew up in LA and your last name is Johnson, there's an expectation that you're gonna play basketball <laughs> at some level. And he was never one to like to put the pressure on us to succeed, but it was always just ingrained in around. It's like everywhere you go yeah. for, for the bulk of my life, which is funny now, but I was that's little Marcus. Like I didn't I didn't have a name. Like nobody knew Josiah. Like that's that's little Marcus or my older brother's name is Chris. So that's little Chris. Mm -hmm. So every time you roll into the gym, like nobody even knows what your real name is. I had but, that. But now it flipped, and now it's like, oh, that's Josiah's dad, or that's Josiah's brother. Oh, so it's, it's funny for me to see. But so my mom, my mom and dad met uh, in like the late '70s. He was he was a player of the year. He was out in New York. My mom is from Trenton, New Jersey. So they met in New York. She was doing some modeling stuff. Uh, they kind of dated off and on. They had me. They weren't together at that point. He was playing in Milwaukee. Uh, then he ended up getting traded from uh, the Bucks to the Clippers. Got to come back home to LA, albeit with the the Clippers, which, as y'all know, back in the Donald Sterling days, which, you know, sports arena days, which is just sad. I, I look back now as a kid, seeing dudes like Elgin Baylor, you know, but not knowing Elgin for his Lakers career, then just knowing him as the GM of the Clippers and seeing this just defeated dude walking around, with, you know, proud black man, but having to be, you know, the GM of this right. franchise where he can't even get it off. He can't get players in. You know, Donald Sterling wants the team to suck, but. So we moved to LA, I think probably like 84, 85. I was like two or three years old. And it's weird, I, didn't, I had a relationship with my dad at that point, but he was playing in the league. So I didn't really know who he was kind of early on. And that's even something now with my kids, I'm just happy that I'm in a better spot where like my kids from day one, like I've, I've been around them, you know, I've been at the crib all day, every day with them, just trying to be a part of that life. And that's no fault to him or whatever. It's just he was doing his thing, he was playing in the league. Y'all know that that league life is what it is. 
But then he moved to the Clippers, so we got to move out here. Uh, my older brother Chris is my half brother. We all moved together, and, and we lived in Bel Air. So everybody, you know, watched Fresh Prince of Bel Air. That was my life, like growing up. But really, we were we were isolated because it was in the cut. Like, and that's because my dad grew up in View Park. Uh, the house we actually ended up moving there when I was young. But the house, you know, he got when he first got in the league, it's literally right in the center of View Park. Like anybody can roll up on it. So people just roll up on the crib all the time. He's all right, I got to move. Like I can't, I can't just have people rolling up on my spot all right. hours of the night. It's like literally like right across the street from this this walking park over there. So all hours of the day. Any crazy stories? Uh, living over there? No, I mean not 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 rough stuff. Nah, not mm -hmm. some. Nah, it, I mean it's a cool neighborhood. Like mm -hmm. everybody, it's it's kind of older, well to do. One of the most like successful black neighborhoods in the country. So everybody there cool, but. My dad lives there. My, my grandparents, who now passed away, lived a block over. My aunt lived two blocks over. My other aunt lived oh, two blocks dope. this way. So the whole family is all within like a mile radius of each other. So super tight, connected, and all that stuff. But then he moves out to Bel Air, and then kind of everybody now comes out there for barbecues and do things like that. But growing up kind of in his shadow and, and just being around UCLA and all those type of things, I actually went to Crenshaw High School where he played at for my first two years of high school. But I was kind of undersized. I was like a five-seven freshman. So, like, I'm a five-seven freshman trying to try out for JV varsity. That shit's just not. It's, you know, like I'm getting fucking these grown ass men there. I'm a late bloomer, kind of baby fat, all that. Just get my ass dusted. But ended up transferring to the school Montclair Prep, where his best friend and college teammate, I ended up taking the head coaching job. So he was like, "Look, you come here. You can play the whole game. You can do whatever you want. Oh, easy, done, out there." So I was able to follow his steps to UCLA, follow his footsteps, but. You talk about, you know, Hall of Fame finalist, five-time All-Star, all that great shit. It's like, all right, I knew kind of I wasn't going to hit that that level. So it was definitely a ton of pressure for all of us. He's got five sons. We've all kind of felt it to some extent. Right. All of us played college basketball. My older brother, Chris, played professionally across the world. But, you know, it's tough because I look at, like, MJ's kids, and you know, like, you know, them, them dudes, like, back in the day had games on ESPN and shit in high school. Mm -hmm. They getting cooked by Eric Gordon, and it's like <laughs> they got to, you know, they're just – they getting clamped. We you know. remember that. Yeah, yeah I'm saying, but you that. know, you know what I mean. And yeah. it's like now, you know, you, you have this level of pressure because everybody looks at you, and you're supposed to be like your dad. And it's like, yeah, you're not gonna hit that that level at some point. But I think for to, for his, you know, the benefit of him, like he always was cool about it with us. He never forced basketball on us. Wanted us to pursue other activities. Arts. So I was doing a lot of cool shit as a kid, taking film classes, film school, and just random shit to help kind of the artistic side. But yet at the end of the day, I'll never forget. He played in the, uh, I want to say it was 85 or 80, I think 86. He played in the All-Star game in Dallas. Uh, we going to pick him up at LAX, and he's got this big-ass Nerf mini hoop that he brought back to the family. And I, I remember that was, like, the first hoop we had. With the, like, the janky Nerf balls. I don't know if you remember back in the day. The divots yeah. would get in them and all that shit if you yeah. dribbled them too much. Mm -hmm. But basically got to the point where that thing was just, like, Beat holes down, all in holes, it. Holes, all that. And then finally Still tried to rip it in half and, and start over again. But just, just that, you know, me and my older brother, we would – play one-on-one -on -one against each other in our den. We had like two little janky hoops set up. And then uh, my dad, so I didn't get to see a ton of him in the league because he actually ended up breaking his neck. Um, this was like 86, 87, I can't remember now. But game against the Mavs actually, he ran into Benoit Benjamin who was a teammate on the Clipper stomach, twisted his neck. So for a lot of my young life, Pops was walking around the house in a big ass neck brace. They didn't know if he, you know, the, the Clippers and Sterling wanted him to get this surgery that if he would have got it, it was a chance for paralysis, so he could have been paralyzed. Mm. So he was like, fuck that, I'm not doing this shit. But seeing him like down, kind of defeated, like not being able to do the thing he loved, so it was tough for kind of the early part of my life. Like he was definitely, he wasn't in a good place for that stuff. And right. you know, anybody who talks about the, the game in the 70s, 80s, obviously there was a lot of drug issues, things like that. Mm -hmm. He kind of got caught up into that world. But what I will say, the positive, like early 2000s, he, uh, he just went, he cut all that shit out, so now, like for the last 20, 20 some years of my life, I got to see like who he really was. Cause you would see, you know, brief glimpses of it. Like damn, this dude is cool as shit, smart, right. like actor, all that shit. Everybody sees white man can't jump and all that type of stuff yeah. just to see that side of him, but like super brilliant. So now to have him in this like great space where, you know, he don't drink, he don't do any of that shit. And as a result of it, I kind of toned down a lot of stuff I was doing out of respect for him. Like I'm not gonna be around this dude all drunk right, or right. turned up or any of that type of shit. Or anytime there's a function, or whatever, we're all ordering cranberry juices out of respect for him. So I really appreciate him for, for helping me with that side of my life too. Cause shit in college, I was turning up. Like yeah. I was at UCLA, my roommate TJ Cummings from Chicago. Just for my pops, man, just being like, just, just a great leader, role model. And also showing too that, you know, just because you're in a down place of life at certain points don't mean you gotta stay there. You can get out of it. 
Because, you know, every time with him, he'd be turned the fuck up. Like, you know, mm-hmm. seven in the morning, he's drinking Mickey Grenades. Like, mm-hmm. and this is shit you would see as a kid and think that was normal. Like, this was just some normal shit for me. But also seeing this new side of him where now he's kind of, you know, handled responsibilities as a dad, as a man. It's just been phenomenal seeing it's, it's helping him in his work life, his career. He's working with the Bucks now. He's won like four Emmys now for his broadcast and shit. So it's, it's, it's motivating and inspiring for me too to, to keep following in those footsteps. And now I'm doing on air shit and hosting shit like him, which I never wanted to do. Uh, and, but just kind of trying to, you know, be, be on, somewhat on his level. That's fire. You talk about it real positively. Yeah. Like those problems you have with your pops. But was there a point where it felt like, you know, that type of situation or like, say for instance, like his drinking or drug yeah. use or whatever, did that ever like tear you apart from him? No, I resented him. You- and, I, and when I go back and look at it now, cause I'm 40 and I'm able to really kind of process this shit. I resented the fuck out of him for a long ass time. And for me, I knew the one way that I could get back at him was, was pretending like I didn't give a fuck about basketball because I knew how much he loved it. So I was like, all right, I'm, I'm gonna get back at your ass by uh, go work out or shit, nah, I'm chilling. Like, go do that, nah, I don't give a fuck. I'm not gonna do that. And I, I kind of look back at that now and that was a way for me to kind of be able to fight him and show him the hurt that I had. Like, oh, I know this is the one thing that's gonna hurt your ass too. You know, if I, if I don't go play well or do whatever, because he would show up to the gym all the time. And our pops was funny. I look at it with all my other brothers too. So he would do this shit. Like we'd be at my older brother's game and he's unhappy about some shit. He would do, he would have the car keys in his hand, but he would drop them shits loud as fuck in the gym so you could hear. And it would just be little like cues like that. Or I remember one time my brother, uh, Chris, they were playing Arizona. He was at UCLA playing Arizona. Chris is balling. Something happens like coach takes him out or some shit. Dad, like two minutes left, let's go. Gets up, walks out the game just so, you know, but so coaches, everybody can see, see him dipping. And I'm like, damn, the game's still going. Like, they're not gonna win this shit. And lo and behold, they go and they, they lose, whatever. But so that was his way, coaching, whatever. And he was he was a great dude, don't get me wrong. But just seeing all that stuff, that was the one way I knew I could I could hurt him, I could get back at him. It's like, all right, if I don't take this basketball shit as serious as I need to, that's gonna be some shit that really like get his attention. Yeah, gets his attention and fucks with him. But like I said, I talk about I'm a super positive dude just in life in general. And ultimately I've had conversations with him now, man to man. I look back and it's like, dude. I can't even imagine the shit that you were dealing with. College player of the year, everybody wants something from you. You know, third overall pick in in the NBA, just was a superstar and didn't really grasp that because I kind of, I saw the Clippers version of him. I didn't get to see the Milwaukee Bucks version of that squad that was sweeping the Celtics and those dudes that were, you know, literally had to face the Celtics and Sixers every year. That was the one thing that was stopping them from getting to the finals and getting to a championship, Dr. J and that crew or Larry Bird and that crew. But just that level of him, you know, all NBA, all this other, you know, he actually knocked Dr. J off, I believe, the all NBA team in like 79 or whatever it was, first team. You talk your shit. And I, but right. I, you know, because it's, we, we're, I mean, he, he's, he's, yeah, he's been a, he's been a Hall of Fame finalist for a few years, and a lot of people who didn't get to see his career, you know, kind of like, oh, well, he, he don't belong in the Hall. But when we really look at it and look at the numbers and look at what he did and having his career cut short with that neck neck injury. It's like, motherfucker, motherfucker broke his neck, dog. Like, yeah. I was at the game. Like, I'm four years old. Like, like yeah. dad is at the hospital. And, like, we go home, every, and everybody's sad and down. I'm like, four, I don't know what the fuck's going on. But then to see him over those next few years, and then he actually uh, ended up coming back, I believe, 89, 90, played, like, eight or nine games with the Warriors. Don Nelson was his coach with the Bucks. Mm-hmm. Gave him another shot with the Warriors. He was, a, a, you know, a shadow or a shell of his former self, though, out there. And you could, I mean, you could see it. It wasn't... You know, he had a couple, I remember he had like, like Nelly let him play, let him rock out early in the season. He had a good game. But then after that, uh, Alton Lister, who was actually his teammate with the Bucks, big man ends up getting hurt. Nelly's like, yo, I got to bring in another big. We got to let you go. So he went from there to Italy, played in Italy in this country, country called Udine, which is right near the Slovenian border. But that was honestly, I think from a hoop standpoint, the, the best version that I got to see of him. Because we were just, you know, imagine like five black people, our family, in Italy, all these people, every time we go out to eat, they would just stare at us, whatever, but we became so close and so tight-knit as a family. And, you know, you look at nowadays with the guys that are in the league, the the, the Lucas and all these dudes, like we were playing in that system then, and, and granted the, the skill level wasn't there, right? but these dudes was fucking, like you, you take like, it's kind of like we, we do shit like this in America a little bit, but the main pro team out there, there was like, there was the, the 18 under team, 16 under team, 15, four, all the way to like 10 years old. Right. And all the kids were practice, same kind of program. We all had the same uniforms and fits and was running a similar similar type of offense and shit. But just to see the way and the impact, and this is what I tell people here all the time when they look at somebody like Luca, is like he was getting this at like 14, 15 years old. 
Like, it wasn't like playing at the Y or playing like some but AU. But don't they, they groom them for pro? Yeah, for, but that's what I'm saying. It's like, oh, but he's you're been, learning plays that are almost what you're going to be running when you're in the league. Yeah, for sure. But like he was in doing high school, you're learning something sense. totally different. Yeah, you learn in this set. You learning to dribble the ball until they come out of their zone. There's no shot clock. <laughs> like, you're doing all type of shit. Then you get to college, it's a brand new shot clock. They not doing that shit over there. This is how it's going to be. Y'all figure it out like this. They groom them for that. They groom them for every action that they gonna have to see. You damn near running that offense by the time you get there for your country. Right. And it's like, hey, you ain't that, right? Back, right. Especially back in the days, it was like, are we gonna take the best players? Coach don't really know. Coach is really just trying to finesse <laughs> yeah, right. Nike deals and some bread, like, you know, really trying to just, just, just cover their expenses. But you're not really getting that. Like, talent may, may you know, overwhelm other teams. Now it's gotten a lot better. But back in those days, and I just always remember as a kid, 89, 90s, like, damn, they were so advanced with this shit. Because to your point, the best kids from kind of some of these smaller teams would all now get on the elite squad, mm -hmm. and they would just work their way all the way up to now they're playing on, on the pro team. Hey, every time we was playing USA anything, we was thrashing everything. I don't know what they got, grooming plays. I don't know what they had going on. We was in that ass. <laughs> select. You talking about select team? Oh, my Man, God. USA I select. But y'all got more was. talent, though. That's what I'm thinking. Y'all can yeah. overwhelm them dudes with talent. I don't know what it was. I said, I don't know who he is, man. I don't care what he does, man. I don't care. We, we ain't know none of them players nothing. I, I I mean, I like how they always find. They always got somebody that come over here and get busy with us. Like, yeah, that I sure. do love. But it just be like. I don't know what they grew. I think that's part of the reason that they don't have that natural creativity and stuff that you get coming over here. Because everybody over here made something out of nothing with yeah. whatever they had in their backyard. And they got it out the mud to where they believe in that so much, it's hard to take it away from. You're going to see so many games that just look different. You get over there and it's like all of them sort of got this similar... Yeah. Same way that they play, same structure, same passing style, everything yeah. is crazy. Like, while we're on the subject of competition, yeah, what was the mentality you had during uh, your playing days, and how do you use that to like approach, uh, you know, social media? Like, is it like a competitive thing to get like yeah. tweets off and for sure gifts off? I think, I think, I mean, what I take pride in on the social side now is that I'm a one man band. So I do all the shit myself. Anything you see come from my account is coming from me. Right. Nobody tweets for me. Nobody, you know, mm. funny. I like, I, people will occasionally like send suggestions in, but I'm always, and, and, and I, but like, you know, I'll rock with some people. Oh, like, okay, if they're good okay. suggestions, I'll use them. But a lot of times I won't do that because it's like, y'all haven't put in the necessary research to see what else is out there. So you might just be like, kind of, oh, you should do this or do that. But you haven't seen, I already know two people that did that already. I already know, you know, but. Or and you done tried it already. Yeah, for sure. It. And it's not their fault. You know what I mean? I, don't, I, don't, I appreciate everybody who sent shit in, but it's like, nah, somebody else has already done that, and I'm not going to put that out there and get roasted and get called a thief or whatever, and you're going to sit there behind the right. scenes and just be, oops, I didn't know. It's like, <laughs> I, 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 there's no room for that in the shit I do. But I take great pride in literally going up against all these other social teams. And I know a lot of the people that work there, and I'm cool as fuck with them, but they got resources, budgets, mm -hmm. all this shit, and they've kind of turned this thing into a business instead of what it is, like, you know, from a Hooper mentality, when you're just in the locker room cracking jokes or whatever, maybe you're going to play a game, right? You're just going to war and you're trying to beat your opponent, beat that other team, do whatever you're trying to do. It's the same thing for me in social. So when I look at a game, you know, and not to compare it to war or whatever, but we're going into this battle. I'm watching a game against all these other people. Let that be the Super Bowl or the finals or a playoff game, whatever. I got to put better content than them out. And I love that feeling. Like, I think for me, really, when shit took off was during the pandemic and the last dance came out, right? Like, there was no sports on. And for me, I just cracked up. It's like, all right, all, you know, I tweeted some shit, and a lot of people got mad. I'm like, we're going to level the playing field now. Like, a lot of y'all have, y'all can use NBA footage, you can use all this shit. Now there's nothing on. We're going to all watch this show together, and we're going to see who can come with, with, with the best content, funniest jokes, memes, whatever it may be. And I know I was competing against ESPN's social team, but I knew they got those episodes in advance, right? So last dance, 10 episodes, those things were airing on whatever day they were they're getting them three days in advance. So they get to go through them, prep all their shit. They know right at this moment when this clip happens or when Dennis Rodman does the this, that, whatever, that they can get that out. But I was literally beating them, watching the shit cold, watching it live, then the shit that they got to have meetings about and plan and prep out. So I take a lot of pride in that and also just trying to show people that look like ourselves. There's not really, it's changing now, but when social first started, it was kind of this snooty ass elitist attitude 
but everybody was going to black Twitter as their well to get content, right? Mm -hmm. But everybody on these social teams, they would post photos of themselves, like, oh, X, X, team, X team, oh, we got the best social team in the biz. And I'm looking at the photo, I'm like, damn, it's not one black person in this motherfucking photo. Yeah, okay. How, your, team, your league is 60 to 70% black. Your team, of the 12 dudes on the roster, nine of them are black, and you don't got one fucking black person on your social team? For what, like, what's, what's the excuse? And you know, I would call them out on that shit, and people would get mad at me, and I probably would cost myself a lot of opportunities, but I got to a stage kind of like yourself, like, I just don't give a fuck anymore. Like, yeah. I don't, if, if it costs me a bag, whatever, I'm gonna get another one. And I've had so many people kind of try to play me when I first got into this shit, do whatever, that have now come back around, like, oh man, we wanna fuck with you, wanna do this, that, whatever. So for me, I, I'm just gonna keep doing what I think is right, but I always take great pride and pleasure when I'm literally going up against an account, and I've got like, like 200 some thousand followers on my account, but I'll go up against an account that got 10 million or 20 million, 30 million, we going head to head, and I put my shit out, and their people from their team got to hit me like, damn dog, like. That was all right. But I also know too that their shit, I can be out of pocket, right? I can be, I can, I can post clips like from my boys in the hood. And I know if we both take boys in the hood, their social team and me, I know the shit that y'all niggas can't different. post. Yeah, I know this shit's gonna be different. You can't post this scene where Ricky gets gets smoked out or whatever. You gotta, you gotta post all the PG shit. I can post shit that's different and deeper than y'all. And I know your manager, I know your manager, I know he won't let you fucking put that shit up, so. It's like, uh, um, music videos that have that all moment like you got to see that car crash so everybody takes the moment serious and then that humor yeah. can creep in because you have that moment of silence at first you know what i'm saying so i i, I don't know why big companies don't understand like uh, I, like you got to unlock it at some point like we can't just only pick and choose what we're going to talk about it's a, it's a weird spot to be in, and a lot of these companies, it's kind of funny, man. Like, you take somewhere like ESPN, I got a tremendous amount of respect for everybody that works there, mm -hmm. but ESPN has established itself as kind of the sports journalism leader, right? But now they're trying to post memes and shit. But it's like- Because you'll miss out. But it's like the people that run your company, literally, right. they they're don't post memes. People. Yeah, they not those people, they're so they not saying, gonna understand all right, it. All right, we see the shit that everybody else is doing. All right, y'all little young niggas, go do, this, go do that shit. But it's like, this is not what you do for a living, this is it's not, not y'all. gonna be the same. So y'all showing up to the block, and it's like like the feds showing up to the block, like, oh, we got memes, and we, you know what I mean? Like, it just don't make no sense, but I understand it. That's crazy. They wanna run their I numbers thought up. thought about it like that. But it's corporations, right? So the people at the top aren't, they're literally in stuffy offices all day. They're not on the streets or on the block, and that's for me, even now, as I've gotten older, I gotta be respectful of what these young kids are doing, right? Because they're the ones, when I was young, we were still they the culture. They still do shit. Y'all niggas still go out, and see the world and shit. I'm at the crib with the family, so I gotta take y'all word for, oh, this is hot, this isn't, mm -hmm. this is, you know, this is what we do, this is what we don't do. And I think a lot of people, when you get older, you look at what young people do, like, oh, why the fuck y'all do that? Like, we didn't do that when we were young. Right, right, like, it it's doesn't different. Matter. It's different. We we talk about, me and Iman talk about that all the time, like the, uh, the difference in growing up, how, you know, in the 90s, when you didn't have cell phones, you yeah. had a constant, you know, grapple or communication amongst the whole world. Like now you can send something out and be in contact with everybody or everybody can respond to For it. For sure. It's my biggest pet peeve. <laughs> what? That people don't understand that. Like I get in trouble all the time for going long periods of time without my phone, but I'm like, bro, that's literally how I got good at basketball. I didn't, yeah, for sure. I didn't have one. That's, I think the, the th we've, we've lived through every different version of it. So we were all around when we first got the chirp mm -hmm. or the two mm -hmm. ways mm -hmm. and how that started to make a communication. But now shit is too easy and I'm kind of the same exactly. way. Like I'll go work at companies, right? And companies have Slack now and all this, this advanced technology. But I'm like, that shit does not help productivity because exactly. y'all niggas just bother me now. Exactly. <laughs> I'm, right, real. Like, right. I'm, I'm trying to lock in. Like and nowadays, I, I, that's why I kind of become more freelance because you go work at companies and nowadays everybody wants to have meetings all day, this, that, whatever. It's like, nigga, I need to work. Like, right. I'm not trying to sit in this fucking meeting to talk about the work. I got to go do it and really be in the field. It's like, if you hooping, now we're not going to sit in a meeting talking about the workout you're going to do. Like, no, I'm going to get that working. I'm, I'm busy. Like, I don't have time to be on that shit. Like, because you start to use these things and I don't knock to knock slack or anything like that. And I see everybody, you know, everybody in the back. <laughs> under, but, but it becomes now y'all can bother me too much right. as opposed to back in the day, if I wanted to bother you, I had to phone call or if you didn't pick up, I had to pull up to the crib, right? And that's, oh, that's we had to actually interact and engage with each other. Now everything is so simple and streamlined and it really has the the reverse effect of what it was created for. Like it was supposed to be created to make all this shit easier, but it's now an annoyance. Now man. they just want to yeah. bother you. Now we're not talking about work shit. You're bothering me about some other shit and now we spent the last hour debating Kobe or LeBron or whatever the fuck, you know, people right. do. Right. 
and I think I still got to go do work. So I'm the same <laughs> way. Like I, 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 I'll unplug and you know, you wasted my time. Because people will see me tweeting and then they think they could they could call me or text me. Like, oh, well, I know you. Right. It's like, nigga, this is work. I know it doesn't make sense to you. I know you don't really feel like that. This is a job because it's just Twitter. But I'm literally on the clock right now. As crazy as that may sound. So the, the moment I, I look at my phone to go text you back or whatever, I might miss a big ass play that not everybody's talking about, and I'm fucking late to late to market with my shit and not getting the numbers I can because you wanted to ask me about some other stupid shit. Maybe what's speaking of tweets? Have you ever had a tweet that you're like, either? First off, what's the time window on that? You saying like having your response yeah. out to where you hit that moment? For sure. One. But two, has there ever been a tweet where you're trying so hard to hit that window, you regret what you did? Like, yeah, for sure. Maybe I overstepped or I no, just was stupid. So my whole thing is being out of pocket, right? But when you're out of pocket and you're crossing that line, sometimes you do it. And as I've gotten older, I have to recognize and understand that that shit is out of pocket. And I'm thankful that I've got a nice circle of people. You know, I mean, I don't listen to everybody, but people will hit me up. And the problem you run into on social and Twitter now is everybody's trying to just tear everybody apart, right? Somebody put some shit up that people don't agree with. Now everybody's coming out the woodwork to try to take their shots at them, talk shit, get their kind of negativity in. And I used to do a lot of that shit too, but as I got older <laughs> and found myself on the other side of it, you know, you get packed up a few times. It's like, all right, yeah, yeah I'm not. And now when I even see people doing it, I'll just pull them to the side. I'm like, I'm not, you know, I can make an example of your ass right now if I wanted to, but I know where your heart's at. I know you're a good person. You shouldn't have put that up. You shouldn't have made that comment about this shit. This is not something you really understand, like mm -hmm. to be to be commenting on it. But I've definitely had some shit that that's been out of pocket, and it's crazy. Some of my most out of pocket shit is tough. Like I'll give y'all an example. During the tournament, uh, St. Peter's was was busting everybody's ass. Mm -hmm. So I put a a, a a video up. It was like a a Roman uh, Roman like baptism or some <laughs> shit. But I didn't know the the context <laughs> behind it. I just saw the video and like the dude was like <laughs> baptizing a kid, but he was. He was going too hard on the baptism. <laughs> I know what he's talking about. And, but, I, and, but, I, and I, but I put it up, and I'm not even thinking about it. I'm just thinking, right. like, I'm, I'm just thinking, oh, that's what Funny. they do out there. Yeah. Like, oh, this is just a normal shit they do. Then come to find out the context, more of the context behind the video. That's a lot of shit on social. You don't always oh, what, get. What was the context behind the video? So basically, he had, give, he had baptized him, but like the kid ended up passing away mm -hmm. because apparently in their culture, that, that's how they do it. They like jam the kids into the water. But there's been a whole bunch of outcry and outrage, and this shit I learned after the fact yeah. about that style of baptism. Like you know, you know, I don't know if y'all are baptized or not, but yeah. we get baptized. They just put you in the shit yeah, real quick yeah. and take you out. Like they're they like fucking dunking the kids you like had basketball. To seen the, yeah, you had to see the video. It was all over. Oh, no, I the can't watch it. Fucking preach was just. Yeah. And I'm and I them. but and that's like I'm so out of touch with it. But then then I then people hit me and I'm like, yo, take that shit down. And normally it's like sometimes you're like, oh fuck y'all, y'all don't know what y'all talking about. But then as I did more research, I'm like, oh, I gotta get this shit the fuck out of here. And it's like, you know, apologize and just kind of, yeah, no, for sure. And But these are just a part of the game. Like, and, and people are guilty of doing that shit a lot of times. They might say some stuff that's that's out of pocket or whatever it may be. But it's like, yeah, you can you can apologize and fix it. And we talk about cancel culture and all that bullshit nowadays. I done seen like hundreds of niggas get canceled and make more bread off the canceling than they were making Real before. Time. So that's, that shit doesn't really exist. That's all kind of just a lie and a myth. It's just when when that apology happens, are you, is it a genuine apology? Is it a genuine unawareness? I think when that's communicated, people just sort of judge for themselves. Are we going to keep fucking with you after that? Yeah, for like, sure. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like, like I said, the world is so ready for all conversations that they understand. You might have just tweaked, and we want you to admit in 30 seconds of knowing you tweet. Yeah. Just tweet right out, right there. Hey, y'all, I'm a jackass. My bad. I fucked I up. Know. I'm about to go read up on it right now. Y'all just put me on. Please don't cancel me. Like I, I, I think it depends on what you do. It for sure. But it's like there's some stuff that is like, honestly, the reason people get canceled <laughs> is because after they say what they say, we all know you meant it, but you'll go up there with a weird response that your PR typed mm -hmm. up for you instead of just going up there and be like, I'm sorry, guys, that this rubs people the wrong way, although I will not change what I just said. Because I really meant that. But I can always dap somebody that stands in their truth. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And I feel like we can't ask people to be truthful. And then if they say they truth, we bash it over. And now we look, they feel like, oh, now I need to lie to everybody. About but how the, the thing you run into and the problem you run into a lot of socials, people will stand on their soap, soapbox and act like they're holier than now. And these yeah. will be the motherfucking same yeah. people that do all the fucked up Without shit. Without a doubt. But they'll try, you know, and I see that shit, especially like you see like, 
people getting ratioed on Twitter, right, where their quote tweets are just everybody just killing them, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, but y'all people are no better. Like I did a show with Colin Kaepernick, right, and, and I'll see people come at Cap and they'll be like, oh, no, we need to boycott the NFL, whatever, whatever, you stop watching this, that, whatever. It's like, motherfucker, you, you think shit is any better at your company? Your company do the same shit. You ain't boycotting your company. Everybody wants somebody else to go do some shit that they wouldn't do because yeah. they think, oh, man, boy, it's like I'm not mad at the players. I want them to get their bag. Am I mad at the infrastructure and the ownership for how they move and shake? Yeah, I'm still going to watch football, though. I still want to support these dudes. Like, Cap still wants to play in the NFL. And it's like, well, why, why do you want to do that? Because, like, this is my dream of my life, bro. I put my heart into this shit. Like, everything in America is fucked up. We had to go make a list of shit we needed to boycott because there was some bullshit going Dang. on at the top level, we wouldn't be doing shit. Like, right, we right. Be, we wouldn't have nothing. We would have we nothing have to nothing. do. Like, you know, be, but people, you know, you, people who work at a company, it's like, bro, your whole executive level is white people and you have no chance for growth, but you're gonna tell somebody else to go boycott some shit over there because you think, it's like, take a look at your own shit. And that's kind of how I operate in the stuff I do now. It's like, yeah, I'll happily take money from these people because I know that me not taking money, I'm gonna give it to somebody else. Like, yeah. all this shit is fucked up and I can't fix shit from the outside. I gotta fix it from the inside. Or I gotta create uh, yeah. enough whole avenue. I gotta create enough money over here that I could collect, that I can apply what I feel like will help. Yeah, for sure. That's my shit that I'll just be on. I'll be trying to get a nest egg big enough to do all our little ideas. <laughs> and I say go do them shits. But like, even we had you on our joint, and within 30 seconds, I'm like, this motherfucker need a podcast. You need, don't waste your time here with I us no more. I appreciate that. Hey, the king of Twitter said it first. But ultimately, when I see stuff now, people are like, what you think about it? If, I don't, if I'm not rocking with it, this is somebody's art, man. If somebody put their heart into this shit, it might not be for me. I'm gonna still be polite about it. I'm gonna be like, oh, fuck that nigga, don't go right, see his shit. Right. Like, yeah, I've never understood the, the, the extra over the top hating. It's the, no, it's the competition. But that competition, the competition is not, but the over the top hating, like, I'm talking about the trolling and the like. People will go on there competition. and be like, "That's competition." But it's not. It's them. only competition if you got a movie too. No, not really. You know what I'm saying, you, like, you be I, the, but you could be the best at trolling. Like niggas could be literally looking at your page. Well, just then you got to gotta compete with troll. another troll. Talk about. That's, you know what I'm saying? It works. For Talk about who got the first works. comment. Like some of them do. They be like, "Ooh, first comment." <laughs> yeah. Argue like, who about cares? That? Like, damn, but, nigga, but you, if you was in the house not doing shit, like, oh, look at me, I'm world. Oh, don't watch shit. I seen it. Don't watch. 15, <laughs> don't watch 15 seconds of the movie and then be like, it's trash because. But this is this is the problem that especially in the black community we run into when we talk about our art. Like, I'll give you an example with my show, Legend of Chamberlain Heights. Uh, IMDb, some people apparently use their rating system to determine if shit's mm -hmm. good or not. Before our show even aired, we had like three stars on our IMDb page because Comedy Central basically promoted this thing like, oh, it's gonna be the, the Black South Park or whatever. So South Park fans saw that shit like, fuck it is. They didn't even watch the episode yet. They was just like, we gonna one hate. One star, yeah. one star, this shit is tired, it's trash, boo woo. It's like, nigga, we haven't even, like have you seen something I haven't? Cause I haven't even seen the episode yet. Like, <laughs> are you watching something that I don't right, know about? Right. But you find that so, and this has been something that's been brought to the forefront by other people that I've seen, like those rating systems, you look at any black piece of content on IMDb, more times than not, it has unfavorable rating. ratings. Yeah, low rating. Great shows, like shit, shit that we are think is hood is classics. Mm -hmm. Go look at that shit, and this is indicative of the world we live in, and people just hate just to fucking hate, because they're mad, like I got people that hate on me, like man, your shit is terrible, I hate you. It's like, all right nigga, your shit's terrible too, but the difference is I don't look at your shit. <laughs> Right, I don't see you. I don't even, yeah, like, I don't see you. Like, I'm gonna go to your page and tell you how much I don't like your shit. But really, a lot of those people is like jealousy and bitterness because they look at me like, oh man, how come this nigga get to do it? I could do that shit too. This is my favorite thing to say. Like, everybody be like, oh, I can do this shit too. It's like, nigga, you have an internet and a phone, go do it. Do it. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm not stopping you. That's what I'm, I, I, that's, I don't get the haterism. I just feel like it's, it's more, it's, it's a lot of people projecting their own shortcomings just, and their own fears, right? It should just be a lot more, uh, should just be a lot more creating done. Like, yeah, for sure. Should just be a bigger hall of art. I don't know. That's my thing, bro. Less hating, more creating. If you hate my shit, knock me off the paint. Because ultimately, you push me off the block, then. Right. Man. If you can. Well, you mentioned it earlier, uh, working on uh, Colin Kaepernick's series yeah. um, with Netflix. What was it like working on that? So this is, I'm a big Raiders fan. And I, and I tell Cap, Cap is the only human being that'll ever get me to, to wear a Niners jersey. But I remember 2016 when this thing first started, just appreciating and supporting what he had going on. And I think, you know, especially people like ourselves that you 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 attain some level of success in this country, and they kind of look at you like, what you got to be mad about? Like you make money, like as if that like as if making money as something just means that all those issues and problems go away. 
So when, when Cap first started his protest, I was super supportive of it. I remember I was at a Comedy Central Emmy's party, literally showed up to the party. This is 2016, never, never met the man. I was like a couple weeks after he started, I showed up in a, a Cap jersey and some American flag pants just because I'm like, yeah, I want to you know, just kind of piss some of these white people off at this event just, and just, you know, get that shit going. But fast forward, started a writer's room like November 2019 uh, and literally Cap came in and he was supposed to come with us for like three or four days kind of just go over his life story as we figure out the episodes and shit we were going to talk about. First day he comes in, that news breaks of that workout, uh, NFL game, the workout in Atlanta. So he's in the room with us, literally, as that, that news breaks. And I worked for the NFL, so I already knew, like, uh, shit kind of feels a little fishy. He had those same sentiments, like, look, we know we, we look at the contract, see whatever it is, but I'm excited as shit. I've been working out six days a week for this moment. Lo and behold, come and find out they wanted to sign some shit because it was like a janky release where, you know, mm -hmm. you know, but just... And that's how they move and get down. You're talking about a multi-billion dollar company. Like, you know, there's always some shit. And, and it's like, we're going to do the workout on Saturdays. This is the middle of college football season. It's like, who the fuck is going to be at the game on Saturdays when all right, scouts, everybody's watching, watching college guys. So, but he, he went and did his own shit, did the workout and performed. But just being around that dude, I think the thing is like, we've seen like Antonio Brown recently and other people taking shots at him. Like, well, I don't never see him in the hood. It's like, how much time are you in the hood? Like, I'm just, I'm like, are you in the hood all day every? Like, are you like the the barometer of what's going on? If you on? are, you're doing something wrong. Like, are you in the hood every day? Like, oh, I didn't see Cap today. Like, Colin Kaepernick attendance. Like, no, nigga, you're, you're literally doing your own shit. What the fuck are you right. talking about? But to see the way Cap, and that's the thing, and the, what I love about him, he don't do a lot of shit for the cameras in, in the limelight, right? Mm -hmm. He's got the Know Your Rights camp where he's doing a ton of shit, giving kids education, knowledge, food drives, all types of shit. But he's not, I'm not trying to be all on the camera like, hey, look at me feeding these kids. I'm just trying to do it without all that bullshit. But conversely, now well, you have other people be like, oh, I don't see him doing shit. It's like, he's not doing that shit for you. Or he's just not doing that shit in your hood Exactly. There's like, hoods all across the country. He's yeah. motherfucker ain't in every single hood all day. I've also felt guilty about that though, because a little bit of that is also control. Um, when being with the NBA, I always felt like I'm like, we do all these events only for like the city that you play for. And it's like that city might get lucky in a couple of boroughs and everything, but it's like, we don't tap into people's homes. Yeah. And just like really. Yeah, for sure. You know what I'm saying? I'm just like the infrastructure that the NBA has. It's just like. You want to connect more? Yeah, I just like with the hometowns, I'm just like, it's some players that's from wherever the hell in Texas mm -hmm. that's a city that don't got a nice court or whatever and he had the, the story where he had to drive all it's like why don't we build one of these NBA care courts over that mom? like you know what I'm saying like we'll always be in some random neighborhood that I look and I'll be like, bro, I don't think anybody hoops over there. Like, <laughs> and they don't even they put a build a court and there don't even be no hoopers over there. Bro do it where they these kids really need a, they yeah. that's all they do all day like they've been dunking on the rims and doing all this broken and yeah. you know what I'm saying they got a random little you know when they used to have like random fountains and stuff on the sideline that is like this stuff shouldn't be here bro but it ain't <laughs> enough room they got a random bench that's like nailed to the cement and yeah. it's like bro mine's been messing their leg up on this it's the beginning of time yeah like I got scars from shit that's just sitting in the park, and I'm like, bro, this is the shit we need to be cleaning up and putting NBA cares. Motherfucker, y'all should have cared. I wouldn't have this scar on my goddamn <laughs> leg. Care about me. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I look at Cap, and I think the shit that he, I mean, he's just a great dude, you know what I mean? Yeah. I, whatever, whatever people think, you know, and it was crazy I did, for me. I never got the afro, though. Did you ever ask him about that? I, I should, but that shit is, it's so long and fluffy and well-maintained now. It's, I'm, I'm just trying to right, I was going to say, what you going to say? It's it's damn near like the shape you I just want to know be. when he became shaft. I just <laughs> didn't feel like he needed the look. He was growing it for a while, though. But he had the braids and all. Yeah, I mean, he, yeah he'd been doing he, it for a He was growing it for a while. But I'm saying, he just got, he, he got it. It was almost, I'm not going to lie, to me, it seemed like he did it like he kind of planned it. Like he was just like, I'm gonna do this, like, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna let the hair down. Like it was like, the, wasn't it the second or third time he had kneeled? That's what I mean, he probably was just sick of the shit. I feel like he kneeled. I'm just saying, I just felt like he went full into the character. That's what I said. Right? No, yeah. that's what I mean. Like he clearly planned that, that was behind the only his thing movement. I like said. we gonna bring a whole, like yeah. we gonna bring a Black Panther oh, oh, oh. film behind this shit. I, mean, this <laughs> I loved a, it. This I would thing. That's what have been the first thing yeah. I had. I love hey, it. Hey, when did you decide you was gonna be shaft? But the shit every time <laughs> you see him fluffy, like it's well made. 
maintain perfect, but <laughs> no, nah, I appreciate no, shit like that. Yeah, yeah, I'm saying, like, that. like you should, should yeah. have yeah. But the thing people don't realize about Cap, Cap uh, grew up in Turlock, California. He, he was adopted by two white parents. So it's like, well, you're not the person to to to, to be, be saying all this stuff. But oh, I, think, I was definitely one of them guys. But but the problem is, is that he grew up in in a spot. And you think about California, and everybody always thinks California a blue state, right? But we got pockets of red, red all over his motherfucker. Mm-hmm. And Turlock definitely one of them spots. So for him, you know, as he got older, kind of started to realize the shit that was going on around him, and started to understand his discover his blackness. He was and, the black kid. And he, but even like, oh, but you're good at sports, right? So mm-hmm. you're one of the good ones, right? Are you good at football and basketball and baseball? So you wanted the good ones. Or you just ones. got two white parents, like, and they just accept you on that. Like, it's, and there's it's, just a lot of shit they didn't know to teach him. And it's exactly, not, you know, you know exactly, I think we did a great job on the show kind of showing what things are like for him, like getting his hair braided for the first time. Like, he was a big AI fan, like, you know what I mean? But getting pulled over. But now, you know, but mom sees it like, yo, take them, yeah, we're going to Supercuts, dog. Like, get that shit out of here. Like, Super. but. But shit, he had to he had to really fester on and live. So people look at him when he start first started doing all the protests and stuff. Like, oh, this just just came out of nowhere, mm-hmm. or you lost your job or whatever. But you talk to any coach, player, people that play with Cap, he's he's the leader. He's great in the locker room. Chip Kelly, who was his coach at the time, like, yo, he's a great dude. Like, right. we love him around here. But this thing that got perpetuated by the media, especially one faction of it, mm-hmm. like even people who who didn't watch the show, we got a scene where we compare uh, the combine to chattel slavery, and it's like. This has been talked about numerous times. But, oh, he's trying to, he's, he's saying he's a slave, this, that, whatever. It's like, I used to work in NFL, work for NFL Network. You go to the Combine, that shit used to be some of the most, like, has to, dudes half naked, just getting poked and prodded, room full of just white dudes eating, like, soggy-ass donuts, just staring at black men. You know, oh, look at his look at his thighs and look at his calves. Oh, my God, look at his arms. Oh, I feel yeah, he's gonna be a good just one. listening to this. So and I, I remember they had to, you looking. And they used to broadcast this shit. It was like the weigh-ins. Like they used to. And it's oh, like no, the combine. Yeah, I know how it goes. I'm just saying he yeah. was actually oh, there. Like looking at it is weird. And like, I'm, I'm, I'm working. I'm like a, a production assistant, whatever. At that point, I'm looking at this so shit like everything. I'm like God damn, this shit is. Fu-. But I'm seeing the other side that you yeah, don't see on the camera. Right. right? That's what I'm seeing the room with like 300 dudes, predominantly white dudes, old like grizzly fat white football coaches. Ugh. <laughs> he's not yet. Oh, his cat. Yeah, it's just. Oh, that's a good one right there. Oh, you know what I mean? Like yeah, looking at these like dudes, like like talking about slaves. And everybody's like, oh, well, there's white people too. So you say it's like anybody who went through that that mm-hmm. that situation. And I think, but that's what they jumped on, like and tried to shit on us about. But it's like there's been numerous articles written about this stuff. The league itself ain't even and acknowledged and stop putting that shit on camera. Like, oh, this is this is this is a little too much. But people kind of just wanted to pick on different things in the show that they didn't agree with. But I think the overwhelming and overarching message, you know, they had to rock with, like from his story, whatever. And you're talking about a guy, I think we wanted to show all his life he wanted to be a quarterback. He literally only had one scholarship coming out of college to go to Nevada, and there was no guarantee there that he was going to be a quarterback. They basically recruited him like, yo, we can move you to safety or wherever if the shit don't work, which happens to a lot of, I remember Lamar Jackson was getting that shit when he first came to the league. Like, oh, we can move you to receiver. Like, motherfuckers ain't saying that shit about Peyton Manning. They're not looking at Eli and be like, ooh, yeah, we can move you to DB if you if it don't work at quarterback. It's like, no, motherfucker, you're a quarterback. Mm-hmm. So for him to get to the league, have that shit taken away, and even now I see people like, oh, he, he should just give it up, whatever. It's like, motherfucker, somebody came to you and you, with your dream and took your shit, and I'm sitting over here like, oh, you should just give it up. Like, come on, man! Like, the, right. like, like what? Or Especially, just like change your shit up and play a whole nother position, even though you grew up doing this shit. Just give it up, whatever. You're not even that good. And it's just like, damn, motherfucker! Like, as much shit we have to deal with in this country, like, you're not gonna just get down to support somebody who actually was a, a pass away from winning the Super Bowl. Like, I can see if he was just like a mid quarterback or whatever, mm-hmm. or just you know, what I mean, like me trying to be a rapper or some shit. Like, mm-hmm. I come, I'm trying, you know, you have to have a hard heart. Like, nigga, you don't have it. Like, right. you. Don't, <laughs> Just in case y'all yeah, don't know, you, man, Josiah you, is not with the hate. Man. You don't. He's you don't. The truth. He'll you don't have you it. Don't and have I don't have it. to. Like, yeah, you're right. I don't. But this is different. Now, if I came in with bars and shit, <laughs> and they not giving me no jobs, you'd be like, damn, dog. That's what, like they. Not, they really. Right. This is some deliberate shit. Like mm-hmm. they really not pumping your shit for some reason. So for me, just my experience with Cap talking to him, looking at him. Like first thing I asked his ass when he came in, and he got pissed at me, and I don't blame him. But I'm like, yo, do you still want to play? Like everybody. I hear all these other people saying that you don't want to play. This motherfucker just looked at me like, bro, don't ever ask me no stupid shit like that again. Mm-hmm. Like, like, and, but I was like, look, dog, I wasn't trying oh, to be I rude. Asked. I had to know. Because everybody else is telling me, you don't want to do this, that, whatever. I got you. I got the source. Like, oh, they're saying this, that. It's like, motherfucker, I'm working out six days a week, right. putting my heart into this shit. And we've seen now with even the videos that have popped up, the workout videos and shit, he still got it. I want to tie everything back to the episode theme. Let's get back to the grind. 
throughout the career, as one door closes, you didn't let it deter you. You yeah. just let it lead you to the next door, uh, to the next room of the house, so to speak. Um, what's the ultimate end goal for you, if there is one? I think at this point, it took me a long time to, to get there, but it's, it's basically creating a network to compete with all the other stuff going out there. I've established a nice lane in the sports media space. That's where I started my career. Like I guess everybody sees the memes and all that shit, but started my career in 05, NFL Network, Fox Sports, all these spots, you know, different companies. Was blessed to create a show for Comedy Central, mm -hmm. blessed to do some shit for Netflix, did another show with Ava DuVernay for our own network that'll be coming out soon. So I understand all these different, that's why I'm so effective with the stuff I do on social, because I've actually learned and trained myself on the other side. So I've, you know, I've produced, like we, we, we joking about mic placement or whatever, when you walk mm -hmm. into the booth, yeah. you know exactly what's going on. Like I've been on this other side. I've been, you know, somebody on the crew sitting here taking notes while, while somebody else is being interviewed and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I have an appreciation and love and respect for all the different things that go into making these things happen. So I think now being able to build all that stuff, do it all, like I'm getting old, I got kids now, so time is of a premium. Like I'm trying to focus on my kids, get them on that LeVar ball so they can be the next, you know, Lonzo, LaMelo, whatever out there. But we'd we'll love to start a company now to give people that look like ourselves a chance and opportunity. Cause this, I mean, the, the amount of money that's being made, it's both social specifically, it's like a multi-billion dollar industry now. Mm. Like the amount of shit I get paid for one tweet, the tweet will take me about 15 seconds. And I tell people that and they'd be like, damn, duh. it's like, nah, it took really like seven, eight, nine years mm -hmm. though reality to build this shit up, all the, the, the good, the bad, getting packed up, getting tomatoes thrown at you, whatever, all that type of shit to get to this level. So it wasn't an overnight thing by any stretch of the imagination. But now to be able to put myself in a position to help this next group of people that are trying to get into these spaces. And it's still like that, man. Like I said, these leagues, 60, 70% black, you go look on the other side, uh, the, the, the companies like an NFL network or NBA TV or whatever, it's not really reflective, like, and we're not saying, damn, we need 60 to 70%, but can we Just get like 25, right. can we get 30? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, because we're all capable and intelligent. The same way, it's funny, like you look at the NBA, kind of when it first launched, the Bob Cousy's of the world and a lot of these guys that are now, you know, in, in top 75 still, it's really because niggas in the hood wasn't getting that opportunity to go play. Like you might get a Bill and Russell. And playing against plumbers and shit. Yeah, man. but you know. Firefighters. Smoking cigarettes at halftime right, and shit. Like right. all types. Like they got shit to do. <laughs> Drinking beers, families. <laughs> But now, as you, like football, same way. Like football, I want to say from like 34, 1934 to 46, no black players were allowed to play. So like, how do I look at the records from those time periods? You're not even got your most talented people. But this is, and it's kind of a similar mentality that permeates on the other side, where it's like people are going to hire people that look like them. You know what I mean? They're going to rock with people. And it's, I remember, I'll just tell y'all something crazy, you know, different, but, so I work a lot in Hollywood. So I remember when the George Floyd shit first happened, all of a sudden everybody now, oh, we want to, do more black shit. So literally, I started, all over, I started to realize I was a lot of white people in the industry, like only black friend. Cause they're like, oh man, we want to take meetings and you have ideas and yeah, come on, we want I'm, I'm trying to, but really they were just trying to pat themselves on the back, make themselves feel good. Like, hey, I met with three black people today. I'm making a difference. Right. You know what I mean? I, I saw a wave where like everybody, like who had white assistants were getting black assistants. So like the name that started to show up on the emails would be like, oh, okay, like all right, yeah, I can get down, oh, Kiana or whoever, okay. Mm -hmm. But I also knew like, it's not gonna last because they're not gonna be able to bond and relate to these people the same way that they would with the assistant who looks like them, who they see themselves in, or oh, let's go get drinks after work and let's hang out. Like they're not doing that with their black assistants. And I'm kind of the same way in spots I work at. Like y'all going to grab beers, I'm going to the crib. I'm not like, that's not my thing. Like, that, but that has nothing to do with the, what I bring to the work. Yeah, like, I'm gonna I'm do my job, I'm gonna excel at that shit. Y'all wanna go hang out and do all this other shit after? Nah, I'm not really, that's not my shit. I'm gonna go to the crib. But that's how you really advance and, and, and move in this game, right? By being able, because when you do that now, oh, well, that's the person I want to give the promotion to because I hang out with them all the time. I see myself in them. That's the person I want to invest in. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you the millions. You might give me a terrible idea, but I see myself in you. Oh, you fucked this one up here. I'll give you a couple more million. You'll figure it out at some point. And we don't really get that those opportunities. So I would love to create something in that space just to be able to help the next generation. It's not, you know, for me, it's like, I just kind of see a more diverse world. So it's not all black people, white people. They're talented people across the spectrum but making sure that everybody, you're really hiring the best candidates, putting your best foot forward, where people pretend like they want to do that shit because it sounds good. They'll put the black square up because that's easy. Oh, I can... Right, they can feel better after that. Oh. Hey, we need more black people, but I always yeah. joke, like especially in sports entertainment, hey, we need more black people here, but it's like, what white person's going to be like, oh, I'm quit, you take my job. 
No, fuck no. Like that's not that's not. They'll be the one. Hey, we need more black people as long as they don't impact my shit. Mm-hmm. That's what they're really saying. So ultimately, we just got to go take like y'all were saying before. We just got to go take our shit. You can't really be asking anymore. We live in a world now. I live in a social spot. If I, I mean, if I like NFL Network with these companies when social first started, like y'all want to do some social shit. Maybe they let me do it. Maybe not. Now I go do it and run up numbers on my own shit. Now it's like, oh, they come to me like, yo. You ain't got nobody to answer to. You already do it. It's like, so we live in a world now where you can do this shit. People can start podcasts. They can do a bunch of stuff where they don't need somebody to hold their hand. But the problem that a lot of these young kids run into is they might do some shit for a couple of weeks, don't get a million followers, and now it's like, I give them giving up. Like, this shit is hard. People look at my social account now. That shit took years. They don't see a couple of years ago when niggas was packing me up with the content I was putting out because it might not have been the best shit or tell me how much I suck or I hope you get cancer and die, fuck your family, all that type of shit that you just did. I know you as a hooper over, and it's like, damn, nigga, over a basketball game? Like, you want you want me to, because you don't think I'm, I'm your favorite basketball player? I ain't gonna lie. The worst one I ever got, a fan was like, uh, I hope you tear your other ACL or some shit, but this was like before my return game. Yeah. And that's one of the only tweets I like stop. I, yeah. I stopped for a moment and I was like, damn, bro. I don't want to tear my other ACL in but this how game. how mad you got to be to wish that on somebody. But I was like thinking before the game, like how tragic. I, I, yeah. like, I had never even had that moment <laughs> cross my mind where I was like, I could tear my other ACL. Like. I was like, this is the worst thing that could ever have happened to me. And I got through it. I'm going to play my first game. And then before that London game, I had a fan tweet that. It was like, I hope you tear your other ACL. I was like, what? And, and it's like, for me, it's like, why do you hope that? Like, That's what, right. That's my thing. Like, what type of space you got to be in personally? What's going on in your life that makes you exactly. so miserable that you want that type of shit to happen to somebody else? Right, you human. You want me to tear, tear an ACL? Like, this is my fucking livelihood. This is my bread and butter. I gave my heart to this shit. Been years of my life at parks and all this type Real of shit. shit Blood, sweat, and tears. About, yeah, the, the shit you didn't see because I'm not on the team that you like. I need to die. Meanwhile, owner don't give a fuck about you. Owner, <laughs> owner said nigga pay $100 for right, these tickets. Right, right. Win, right. lose, or draw. Real well, talk. That's how it go, man. <laughs> all right, man, on the show, about this time, uh, Josiah, we usually ask all our guests, what are they thinking about improving on themselves or any aspect of their okay. life right now? Uh, just be be the best person, best version of myself possible, man. I think as I've gotten older, and we talked about this earlier in the show, I understand kind of the mentality that a lot of people have when they're bitter and negative and shit. I had periods in my life, even the last four or five years, where you know, I wasn't working, I wasn't doing the things that I thought I should be doing. And I would always blame other people or try to shit on other people, try to tear other people down because I thought that would make me feel better. But now I just focus on my own shit. So as much as I can just concentrate on improving my own life, being better, exercising, staying healthy. That's something that really, man, I was like 380 pounds probably like three years ago. And then once the pandemic started, I'm like, yo, if I get this shit, I'm done. Like, like I'm, I'm the prime candidate to be deuced out if this shit, you know, makes my way. So when the pandemic started and we was all locked in the house, man, I started running like four or five miles a day, just consistently dropped like 70 pounds just to get my life, health, emotions. And I found for me, like working out and doing that type of shit, you gotta get that work in because it just makes everything better. It gets you them endorphins, like makes you just happy about approaching life. As opposed to like, I, before that, I would just sit at the crib, smoke weed all day, eat dessert with every meal, like literally just like every meal, I'm having some cake or ice cream after the shit. And you know, just improving my health, improving, improving my life and just trying to be a better person to everybody. I think there's so much negativity and evil in this world that if you could balance it out with some positivity. And again, like we talked before, like, it may, somebody might make some shit I might not rock with, but I'm not gonna shit it. No, I'm just gonna tell my opinion how to make it better. Take it or leave it, I don't really give a fuck. But ultimately so much in this world, people aren't willing to help each other out because there's a fear that if I help you, that'll put you ahead of me and right. now you're gonna be better than me. I don't really operate like that. Like I, I mentor so many people that work in the space that I'm in. Cause it's like, yo, go be better than me. Like I hope, I hope you push myself to pain at some point and I'm gonna just give you as much game and wisdom and knowledge and be a resource for you so that you can go do it with the hope that once you get in the position that I'm, I'm in and somebody else comes up to you, you can do the same shit for them. So I, as I've gotten older and just kind of got more perspective in life, started having kids, like my whole life is now focused on them. Like I'm sure as you know, like I used to take that money and spend it on me. Like, ooh, I get this check, I'm buying this, that, whatever. Now it's like, ooh, I take this, and like I'm gonna take them to Legoland or I'm gonna take them to fucking SeaWorld, I'll take them to do some shit because I want them to really appreciate and experience and have some a life that was better than whatever I had. Really? So. As much as for all of us as dads and fathers out there, we can give our kids a better life than what we had. Mm-hmm. I think 
you know, that's kind of the, the goal and the dream. So for me, strive to be great every single day. What about, what about you right now? What you improve? To piggyback off that, um, it's amazing how much a, a, a good routine is set up for success. Like, I didn't realize I had a routine my whole life. My mom explained to me like, no dog, you've been like one of the most routine kids I've ever seen. She's like, you gonna get up, you gonna wanna eat. She was like, you used to wake up early with your dad and do stuff with him. She was like, you gonna wanna work out. Um, she was like, you gonna wanna go to school, knock all your stuff out, you gonna race home do all your homework so you can get back outside. Yeah. Like you're gonna be outside until the lights come on. You're gonna come in here, you're gonna try and do everything that you could possibly do and keep telling me that you're not tired. And then you're gonna pass out wherever you are. <laughs> she was like, but literally it was like every day you could do that. She was like, as you got a little older, me and him would add a fight, but it was like, you had winning? the same thing, but I, it was just cool to, to hear you say. She used to cry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's what I'm saying, until I got big enough and then niggas that's want me on their team. Still cries, they still cry. Then niggas want me on their team. I don't um, want you, I'm, when have I ever requested you to be on team? Like I was trying to make a good point here. Yeah, make your point. Um, it was cool to hear you talk about like, people think like, yo, I can go do a little bit of work and then I'm gonna wake up and it's just gonna, it's just gonna happen for me. And it's like, I was, I had a routine and workout for 21 years before I got the job. I had to train for this job, yep. you know what I'm saying? So it's like, I've been doing workouts and thinking about basketball, dreaming about basketball, improving in basketball before I ever got the job. So you 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 translate that to other people and you wanna inspire other people to keep striving for greatness and keep on grinding. There's a lot of people that figure out what they wanna do in college, figure out what they wanna do after college. Not everything is gonna translate into money right away. You may have to work on that thing that you feel like this is the thing that I want to do and I love it. You may have to work on that shit behind the shadows when nobody's watching and still have a job that you fucking hate in order to uh, invest into that dream that you have and that, that job that you want to have to do. But all things take time and all things take routine. Keep striving for greatness. You like how I did that. So you thought I was just going to take it anywhere. That was beautiful. <laughs> But no, nah, but the, the thing that really resonated with me and that, to your point is like, yeah. when you have a job that you might not fucking like, yeah. but work on your other shit. But, but don't, that's the don't investment. Quit, don't quit that shit. Keep getting the bags for that shit so you can do your other shit. And I've even dealt with that. Like I had shit I didn't like doing, but then it flipped and now it's like, damn, I really like what I'm doing now. That's a mindset. It's a mindset. Like when you have to literally flip your thinking into, all right, well, I tried it this way. You know, it didn't work out. Now what if I do three or four more things? Or what if I tried that one thing that I said I didn't want to do, but maybe I'm good at doing yeah. it, or maybe I could do it and people yeah. will fuck with it. So, Cause though you might not like it, you might like the profit that it brings. Exactly. Because the profit let allows you to do the thing that you like exactly. to do. But that's yeah. the mindset, like even if you don't like it, like there's another thing in your mind telling you like, no, there's another positive, like you just paid for whatever and you didn't have that money yeah. before. You know? uh, yeah, or, we need that. Yeah, like you don't like making TikTok videos, but it's putting gas <laughs> in your car, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, I get that now, like before I didn't get that, like I didn't get the whole monetized uh, feeling of it, but now I get that now and I understand it. Every show I like to tap in with the fans on social media to answer some of their burning questions. All right, what we got today? We got a question from, at Dan, is it Dan Yee, 33, from Twitter? Oh, gotta be they Dan wanna know, Ye. Dan Yee, <laughs> Dan, <laughs> Dan Ye. oh, this, I don't like that. I don't like that, Dan Yee. Dan Yee, 33. Yeah. No, I don't like it. Don the question Ye. is, Don Ye. <laughs> the question is, how do you navigate in Hollywood and learn to know the real from the fake? It's like I was telling y'all earlier in the show, man, I think a lot of shit in Hollywood, people think it's like, when they talk about all like the grimy shit in Hollywood that it's done with like malicious intent. Now it's a smile and a pat in the back. So you just gotta start to realize and see the, the real from the fake. A lot of people come to LA, right, with dreams of being, and we, we just talk, touched on this, with dreams of being whatever, actor, writer, whatever it may be, but that's just hard. Like, they don't realize, I meet a lot of people like, oh, I wrote this script. It's like, cool, now go write another one. And then write another one after that. Mm -hmm. Cause there's no fucking guarantee that that one script you wrote, you know how many people just wrote this, a script that they think is gonna get made? That shit is fucking hard, one of the hardest shits ever. We got a show on TV 
and I, I tell people the company I was working with, they had a they had another show with like Matt Affleck and Ben Damon, or excuse me, Ben Affleck. And I'm fucking up now, I'm on it. I need to smoke weed. <laughs> they had a they had like a show with like Ben Affleck, Matt Damon, like an animated joint that didn't get made, and our shit did. So that just and if you ask me, it's like oh, I'm making that shit right, over right. our shit. But there's no rhyme or reason to how this thing flows and moves in, in Hollywood. So really, when you come out here with a dream or a vision, you got to work, got to grind, got to network. And you you know, you, you come out here, a lot of people, it's funny, you see like back in the day, we go to the club and shit, right? And a lot of people, that's their whole life. Mm -hmm. They think the club is what's going to get them to where they need to be. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was just partying with Wayne at the club or mm -hmm. this person or that person. But not realizing that like Wayne's not at the club every fucking night. He's there celebrating Something, something he's done in his own yeah, life. Yeah. He's in the fucking studio every night. But you at the club every single night, you're not putting that work in. So you got to losing put, money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you're not benefiting. If you go in there to network, to meet people, to do things, and that's what I do a lot of shit now, that's one thing. But you just go in to turn up thinking that oh, something's going to magically fall out the sky and give you an opportunity. That's not how this shit works. So I always encourage people nowadays, you're in a world where you have resources at your disposal that you can use. And you go wrote, write that script, awesome. But now go make a short. Go do some shit that you can actually have something tangible to show. Because you show an executive script, it might be the greatest script ever written. But it's like, I don't know who the fuck you are. Mm -hmm. well, I got to now take your script from somebody I don't know who the fuck they are and try to convince my boss, hey, boss, let's go make yeah, this yeah. script. It's really good. And like, who wrote it? I don't, I don't know <laughs> who the fuck that is. Like, yeah, he basically just have some sort of, uh, uh, cite your source, man. You gotta be, we gotta be able to cite your source and see that you got some material to go off of, man. A lot of people will come to you with their dreams and ask you to invest in them. You gotta think about it like this. If you was the rich one and somebody brought you an idea, which you gonna get about 100 ideas come yeah, to your sure. phone a day when you got some money. You gonna, oh boy, you gonna hear about 100 ideas, great ideas that require a lot of money to get behind mm -hmm. that you only heard once you got some money. But when you get, all them ideas, you gotta ask yourself, will something bring back a return? Does something make sense? Or Do how it? long will it take? Exactly. Um, so I would say with me, um, relating back to the question that, uh, you know, do uh, I appreciate you. But Danye. Yeah, Danye, my dog Danye was asking. Uh, Danye, in Hollywood, I still haven't quite figured it out, but I could tell you this. Everything that you feel when you get to Hollywood, you I think you're supposed to feel it. Like people find out people are fake, fake, and then your natural instinct, I know mine was too, was just like, all right, well, cut everybody off. I ain't really, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, no, nah, you can't do that. You got to be able to say, you shitted on me, you cut me, you did whatever you feel like somebody did to you, and you got to say, this is truly my character stand back up, like he said, come with another short, come with another script, come with another TV show you're involved with. You gotta do all the things you can to get the capital that you need and the name that you need in the business that you already ventured out to be in and say, do I wanna stay and live here or do I wanna go move to Montana next to Ye? I'm only saying yeah, because he, uh, Danny, 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 stay on your grind like this yeah, episode. Keep, that's yeah. what I'm saying. Keep the grind is the most important part. You're gonna meet people that that rock with you. You got to be able to tell the difference. You're gonna just learn a lot from doing this shit. Real talk. Motherfuckers want to read a book or, or a manual on this shit. That's not how. Like, I didn't read a manual on social. Like shit, I was getting packed up for. Stop doing that shit. People rock with more of that shit. But whatever you're trying to do in this game, write, produce, create. Ultimately, there's the skills and resources available for you to learn how to do this shit. You're gonna learn more by trying to make a short film and do that type of shit than by writing 20 scripts. Cause the scripts are just words on paper until you try to actually execute those words on that piece of paper and learn, oh, this shit don't work, that don't work. Oh, I thought this was gonna be a good scene. This scene fucking sucked. Like, I'll go back and look at shit I wrote like, damn, this was, I thought this was good. Fuck, right. this was fucking terrible. Luckily, he could be, luckily yeah. he could be truthful with himself. Your show actually funny as fuck. Nah, I pretty, but, I, but I look that at that shit. That Comedy Central show funny as fuck. They let us do a lot of wild shit and uh, you know, some, a lot of it I'm proud of, some of it I'm not, but you know, just to be able to be in those rooms. But as we worked, and that was our first time doing some shit. So I remember being in a writer's room for the first time, scared, like, damn, these niggas are all professionals. Like, mm -hmm. we're not gonna be able to keep up with them. After about two days, I'm like, shit. <laughs> like, this well, shit I'm is fucking. Too. <laughs> I'm a writer. I got jokes too, Chief. It's like, I'm I got shit. But then you see that shit made on the screen. So that's the thing. People are like, oh, man. And, but, you know, 
grind, like make your shit. Cause you write it on paper, then you actually do it. Like you might go write a workout or I'm gonna do all this, that. Then you actually get out there, like I'm gonna do this too. Like, Word. so now get your promo off. What else you wanna promote? Oh shit, man. You're you a know, promoter now too. I'm just, you know, King Josiah 54 uh, on Twitter, Instagram. You can watch Out of Pocket on Wave Sports Entertainment. Yeah. No Chill with Gilbert Arenas on Fubo. Yeah. Uh, I'm doing some stuff with Showtime Basketball. Shout out to the whole crew over there, Matt Stack. Damn. Brian Daly. Right. Not, a, not a lot. A no, decent back. Not, nothing no, he on. Said some. He said some. And then we got season two of Cherish the Day coming out on OM. Thank you, Ava, for giving me the opportunity to work on the show. Okay. Shout out to Terry Schaefer, Raynell Swilling, the showrunners on the show. Shout okay. out to Michael Starberry, Living Legend. Sorry okay. about them bucks. Way to remember the this man. Yeah, he, he got, got the speech in the, in the, the people, the people that are taking care, and that's the one thing, again, if we talk about grinding, but appreciate the people that help you in your grind, right? Appreciate no, I just wanna, I want y'all to hear how fluently he doing this. That's, it sound like he got a speech done, but if you put in that much work with people, you ain't it's gonna forget. Yeah, yeah. It's just easy. Yeah, for people that, that love you and take care of y'all will not, like all that's those people beautiful. have made me better in everything that I'm trying to do. You know, being able to work with somebody like Gil, which I'm sure, you know, for your playing day, you know, Character. Gil is one of the most phenomenal. Like, I didn't, and I grew up in the same area as Gil. Never knew till I started doing the show with him. It's like, dude, you are, you are a fucking mad genius. Like, yeah. like, like yeah, all this smart. shit is strategic. Like, and he's, and he's got a lot of experience in yeah. a lot of different fields. And he's smart as shit. But even being able to, we had Joe on our show. And I literally told you, first thing I'm thinking, like, this probably need a podcast. <laughs> like, <laughs> this shit, but it was just like, you're just a natural at this shit. So to be able to come up here with y'all, man, I really appreciate it. And I'm excited for what y'all got moving forward. Hey, man, I appreciate you. That's a way to sign us off, man. This I appreciate you coming through.